Greetings, everyone. My name is Daryl Seibel, and on behalf of World Lacrosse, it's my pleasure to wish you a happy new year and welcome you to the World Lacrosse Strategic and Olympic Vision Update. While we very much wish we could be doing this presentation with you in person, we are nevertheless happy to have this opportunity to spend some time with you, and we thank our partners at U.S. Lacrosse for the opportunity. It's also my great pleasure to introduce and welcome the Chief Executive Officer of World Lacrosse, Jim Shear. Jim, Happy New Year. Thank you, Daryl. Happy New Year to you. Glad to be here. Jim, to get started, let's talk about the strategic plan for World Lacrosse. World Lacrosse focuses its energy and resources in the fulfillment of a strategic plan that was approved by the membership in 2018. And that plan includes four major themes. Grow, grow the game, popularity, and appeal of lacrosse globally. Build, build a brand of lacrosse and the resources available to World Lacrosse and its members. Lead, lead the sport by improving the core competencies of World Lacrosse, its member NGBs, and its continental federations. And finally, influence, influence the International Olympic Committee and major international sport bodies to one day secure inclusion for, for lacrosse in the Olympic Games. Talk about, if you would please, each of those themes, grow, build, lead, and influence, and why they're important. Those, those key elements of the strategic plan, the four platforms upon which we build our strategic plan, really lead lacrosse to fulfill its uh, mission and vision as an organization. Lacrosse has long had a vision of growing the game so that it's participated in every country in the world and that lacrosse becomes an Olympic sport. That was the vision when I came on in, in June of 2017, and this strategic plan um, really is put in place to achieve that vision. Um, and those four key platforms, grow the game, build the brand and resources, lead the sport, meaning our governance and our structure um, get better, and then influence the IOC are really critical planks to achieving that vision. If we want to talk about growing the game, that's really important for its own sake because that is our vision. We want to grow the game around the world and let um, people in every nation and, and kids all around the world have the opportunity to benefit from this great game. We also want to grow the game so that the IOC um, believes that lacrosse is growing around the world, which it is, but we also are equal to our competitors who are vying to get on the Olympic program in the number of countries that sponsor, sponsor the game. Um, build the brand and resources. Lacrosse has an incredibly strong brand in the United States. It's getting stronger. The game has grown in the United States, and as the game has grown um, and the professional leagues have uh, prospered, the game is, the brand has grown. But it's still very little known around the world, and in particular in mainland Europe, where a lot of the IOC members reside. So we really want to kind of continue to build the brand of lacrosse, as well as world lacrosse as an entity. Um, resources, it goes without saying, we need resources uh, to achieve our, our mission uh, and to undertake our work. We've had some phenomenal donors, and one in particular that provides a huge amount of support to us, but we've got to build our resources and diversify our revenue streams. Lead, World Lacrosse is the steward of the game around the world. We have that responsibility. We've built our staff from just myself in 2017 to eight, soon to be 10, and uh, we've built our management capabilities. Our board has, has continued to, to change from a, a, a board that was more uh, operational to now a board that is more strategic. Right. We've gotten our countries more involved, our General Assembly is more vibrant, but we need to continue to improve our governance structure, both at the world across level uh, and at each of our national governing bodies, but as well as build our managerial capabilities. And, and we've done that, uh, but we still have a, a long ways to go. And the last is influence. Um, we need to be viewed positively by the IOC to become an Olympic sport. Um, and so we need to build our influence in a good way, and that starts with stepping up and being a key member of the worldwide Olympic family, and we're starting to do that. We're becoming more involved and, and putting ourselves out there on various committees and, and commissions. But we also need the members of the IOC, and particularly those who are in, in key positions, to know, like, and trust the leaders of World Lacrosse. And we also need to have them think positively about the sport. And so we'll go out and, and, um, and get to as many events as we can and, and get the brand of lacrosse out there, get the values of the game out there, and get the leaders of World Lacrosse out in front of the Olympic family 
and build our influence in a positive way for the sport. Yeah. Jim, that's an excellent summation of the strategic plan. And again, those four key pillars, grow, build, lead, and influence. That drives much of the activity and work for World Lacrosse at a strategic level. Let's talk now about the Olympic Games. We know many of the people watching this presentation will be very interested in the Olympic ambition. And that really is at the heart of the strategic plan. And really, there can be no more ambitious goal for a sport than trying to secure inclusion in the Olympic Games. World Lacrosse, under your leadership and the leadership of the President, Sue Redford and the board, have set that as our ambition, perhaps as early as 2028 in Los Angeles. Talk about that process, the process of Olympic inclusion, and where World Lacrosse stands today in that process. Very good question. It, it's, a, it's a new process, relatively new process, that the IOC uh, put in place for the Tokyo Games uh, as part of uh, Thomas Bach and the IOC's Olympic Agenda uh, 2020, which was a reform across the Olympic movement. And so they have 28 um, core sports. They don't call them core sports anymore, but there are 28 sports on the Olympic program. But now each host city has an opportunity to add sports that they think are important for their city, uh, their region, and their country. And um, Tokyo went through that process, added five sports. Paris has recently undergone that process and added four sports. LA 2028 will undergo that process, we think, in the fall of 2023 through 2024. Well, lacrosse has an excellent opportunity uh, to be included in the LA 2028 games with the strength of lacrosse in, in North America. But this is a process that's exceptionally difficult. There's a tremendous amount of competitors because the stakes are so high. It's so beneficial for a sport to get on the Olympic Games program, even if it's for one games as a host city sport, because you have a platform that not only virtually everybody in your country consumes, but more than four billion people around the world consume your sport in some way. So it's an incredible platform and opportunity for your sport. But the opportunity, I think, goes back to the individual athlete and their ability to have a dream of being in the Olympic Games. And we would like to provide that for the athletes of lacrosse. We know that virtually, in our polling, virtually 100% of the athletes want to have that dream, particularly in the United States and North America, where the ethos of the Olympic Games is so important. And it's something that, you know, that was a goal lacrosse had before I came on board. It's the prime reason I came on board because we have this goal, we have the capability to achieve it. It's difficult, there's a lot of competition, but we can get there. Jim, I wanna, I wanna spend a little more time talking about that, but, but in doing so, I want you to reflect on it from what we all think is a very unique perspective you bring to your role as CEO. You're the only person in the international Olympic movement to serve as CEO of a national governing body, a national Olympic committee, and international multi-sport games, and now an international sports federation. No one else has done that. You're also an Olympian. Means I can't hold a job. But. <laughs> you're, you're also an Olympian. I mean, that, that, that's a very rare combination of experience. In fact, it's unmatched by anybody in a professional position in the Olympic movement today. You talk about lacrosse having an excellent chance of one day gaining Olympic inclusion. With that unique blend of experience you have, go, go into a little bit more for us on that. Why do you think lacrosse is so favorably positioned? Lacrosse is an incredibly attractive sport uh, for the Olympic Games and for the Olympic movement uh, for, for any number of reasons. Uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, it is a great sport. Um, it's played by a lot of great people around the world. It demonstrates the key values of the Olympic movement, excellence, friendship, and respect. If you go to a lacrosse game, and, and I, I hadn't been to very many before, before I was the CEO of, of World Lacrosse, but um, having the opportunity to get more grounded in the sport now, um, you can feel the culture of the sport. And it's one where the players are, and coaches are striving for excellence on the field of play, but they're doing so in a spirit of friendship and respect for their opponents. Uh, there's a spirit of inclusiveness and diversity in this sport. Um, and it, it's really great experience to, to be a part of that. And it matches up very well with the International Olympic Movement in that regard. Additionally, the sport has um, incredibly growing numbers in North America, which is important to the LA Games, right. but also growing around the world. And it is one of the sports that the IOC is looking to match up with in terms of creating relevance for the future. 
it is a sport that's driven by youth. The IOC wants to embrace youth, and, and it's a great match that way. We also believe that, particularly in North America, the following and the vibrancy of the game, which will allow it to translate very, very well to television and to North American audiences, uh, will create uh, a great addition uh, to the Olympic Games as well. Um, it has all of that going for it. One of the things that we needed to do um, when I came on board, um, and the sport had already looked at, but we are now launching and, and putting into place over the last year, year and a half, and will be um, now launched in, in 2021, is our lacrosse sixes discipline, right. which is a smaller side of discipline. Because if you look at the games, you look at the numbers, the Olympic Games has been capped at 10,500 total athletes. Um, the pro post city sports for Tokyo added 474 total athletes. 234 of those alone from baseball, softball. Two sports. Two sports. Mm -hmm, right. Paris added four sports, 232 total athletes. So we have to keep in mind that we're not going to become uh, an Olympic sport with our full field game. However, lacrosse sixes has an excellent opportunity, particularly if we can get this game to fit the television window, fit the window of live play during the Olympic Games, uh, decrease the cost and complexity of staging this competition, but also creating a product that is very consumable on digital social media. So that was our goal with lacrosse sixes. We're on the way. Um, it's not the full field game, but we think it offers an incredible amount uh, as a potential sure. Olympic discipline. Also, uh, one of our primary drivers is to use this as a growth vehicle right. uh, around the world for countries that might not have uh, leagues and grassroots play uh, for the full field game, but can sponsor lacrosse sixes. So sure. it meets a couple of purposes, but I think we're well on the way. Lacrosse is a very attractive sport. It's a visually incredible sport. It has a tremendous history and, and heritage that's very unique, and we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. Yep. Um, it, it will lend itself um, to the Olympic venue and the Olympic values and ideals. So I'm, I'm in tremendously excited to be part of this sport um, and to take it forward and, and um, see how we stack up and bid for that Olympic inclusion. Sure, sure. We're taping this interview in early January. Just a few weeks prior to our sitting down today, the International Olympic Committee confirmed the sport program for the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. You touched on it briefly, but just go into a bit more detail for us, if you would. What can the lacrosse community take away from that decision, the decision around the sport program for Paris 2024? What does that mean for world lacrosse and our sport as we seek Olympic inclusion? And nothing too unexpected that we didn't know, but it reinforces those things that we've been been working on. The IOC, the IOC is seeking to embrace youth. Yeah. They're seeking to embrace urban areas, city centers, where they can both draw athletes um, from those areas and host those events in those areas. They're seeking relevance um, and, a, and a digital following for those right. sports. Because they're like all sport properties. They have to monetize the games. They have to, they have to monetize them so that they can continue to exist and become sustainable. And if you look at those four sports, surfing, right. sport climbing, skateboarding, and breaking, yep. uh, which is a new sport to the Olympic um, arena, which some might be surprised at. But when you look at those sports, and they can be held over two days sure. with very minimal construction costs for a venue, very minimal cost to film and, and broadcast those games with a small number of competitors in a, in a um, sectioned off urban area of a city, uh, other than surfing, which is being held outside of, outside of Paris. But um, those games make incredible sense for the Olympic movement. Um, and that's what we were blending towards with uh, lacrosse sixes. Um, and we've learned from that, and we'll take that away and continue to progress on our path. And those sports all point toward uh, something you spoke about earlier, and that is appealing to the next generation of sport participants and fans. Those sports are there because they appeal to young people. You know, those sports are relevant today, they're growing, they're vibrant, um, and the IOC feels that those sports, the IOC is not chasing fads, but they think that those sports are, are the future and, and, and they, want it, they want to move in that direction. Yeah. Jim, one of the unique aspects of lacrosse is the connection the game enjoys to its origins and those who created it. Uh, generations ago, the Iroquois created the game and gave it to the world as a gift that we all know and enjoy today. Within World Lacrosse, the Haudenosaunee Nation is recognized as a full member. 
and that means that their men's and women's teams compete in world lacrosse world championship events and they do so at a very, very high level. They excel in world championship competition. But when you move outside of world lacrosse competition, events that are conducted outside the auspices of the International Federation, world lacrosse doesn't set the eligibility criteria for those events. That criteria is set by the governing entities for those, those uh, activities, those events. Talk about the work that you're doing, along with other members of the organization from the board of directors, with the leadership of the Iroquois Nationals to help fulfill the requirements that are customarily associated with eligibility for international multi-sport events. A little bit of background, and, and then we'll get to the heart, sure. of, heart of your question, but in terms of background, you're absolutely correct. We, we as International Federation are unique. I don't know of another International Federation that has an indigenous people, that is a sovereign nation, that participates, that was the founder of, of the game, that still participates at a high level competitively sure. in that game. When you look at the, the population base uh, and the other challenges that the Haudenosaunee face, uh, the fact that they are still relevant and still participate at a high level in international competition is incredible. It's a unique story that is, that is un, uh, paralleled and, and unmatched in international sport. Top 10 in the women's uh, game, top three in the men's game. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's incredible. So. Um, that's an incredible um, story in and of itself. And as an international federation, I think we're very proud of the fact that we have recognized them as a national governing body. Right. We include them in our competitions. However, we don't control the, the, the gates or entry, entry points for the Olympic Games, other major multi-sport competitions, uh, which, which generally tend to follow the Olympic Games eligibility right. standards. The Olympic Games eligibility standards um, right now are that you, as an athlete to be entered in the Olympic Games, you have to correspond to a National Olympic Committee. Correct. You have to be entered by your National Olympic Committee. The Iroquois Nationals or Haudenosaunee currently don't have a National Olympic Committee. Right. Um, they're not recognized universally uh, by the United Nations as a sovereign nation, as World Lacrosse has recognized them. Right. Um, and so they have to overcome both of those challenges. Should they not overcome those, Lacrosse would have to seek an exception um, there, the IOC has made some exceptions, but that won't be an easy process. So we are working now with the leadership of the Haudenosaunee, uh, both the Iroquois Nationals on the men's side and the Haudenosaunee on the women's side as they're branded, to help them form a National Olympic Committee, have that National Olympic Committee be recognized by the IOC, and then they can enter athletes in that way. Uh, failing that, we'll work with them to, uh, to, to try and gain an exception uh, for the Iroquois Nationals and Haudenosaunee to participate in the games. Putting the cart way in front of the horse there because we're not in the Olympic Games Correct. yet. Right. We have a lot of work to do right. uh, to still get to get to that threshold. But we would love to bring the Iroquois Nationals along with us and have uh, both the founders, originators, uh, and one of our most competitive and compelling nations participate in the games along with our other countries. So key critical goal. To that end, we, we have a leadership team a small group of World Across leaders who meet uh, bi-weekly uh, with the Iroquois Nationals leadership uh, just to try and make sure that we are on the same page and we're, we're working together to achieve these goals. I know many of the people watching this presentation will be glad to know that, that the leadership of World Across is engaged in an ongoing, very productive, consistent dialogue with the leadership of the Haudenosaunee Nation to help fulfill that criteria or look at other possibilities going forward. Yeah, we think this, to get to our, to our ultimate goal, which is lacrosse is participating in the Olympics, and all of first our countries, step. Yeah, first step. all of our countries then are eligible, we need to build trust with all of our countries, and in particular, uh, the Haudenosaunee. Um, we need to have great communication, and we need to work uh, in lockstep as partners um, to get this done. And, and we're trying to do that, and I would also say that the leaders of the Iroquois Nation are are as well, and we've been very pleased with, with their willingness to, to work with us and to communicate. Uh, Jim, during the uh, 2020 World Lacrosse General Assembly, the membership approved uh, the first set of official playing rules for the new 6v6 discipline. And I know that in 2021, World Lacrosse will formally launch that new discipline with a brand identity, an international competitive calendar, and more. You touched on this earlier, but I'd like you to spend just a bit more time on it. How important is the new 6v6 discipline to continued growth of lacrosse globally, greater balance perhaps in international competition with more nations 
coming within reach of the podium, and ultimately the Olympic ambition you've spoken about. I like these questions where you give me the answer <laughs> when you ask it, but you're, you're exactly right. To achieve our vision of growing the game and having lacrosse become an Olympic sport, we needed a discipline that allowed us to do both. And we believe, um, given the constraints on the numbers in the Olympic Games and, and trying to fit within their window, as well as a discipline that will allow um, some member countries who are just getting going or parts of their country who, who want to start lacrosse an easier, bear, easier entry, um, we think Lacrosse Sixes is an excellent opportunity to both grow the game and get us in the Olympics. Um, it is a discipline that we think is very exciting. Our Blue Skies Working Group um, did a ton of work. We experimented with the rules for a year. We took it out to our membership. We took it out to Lacrosse Public. We got a great deal of feedback. The revised set of rules was just approved, as you said, at our, our 2020 General Assembly. And uh, we're looking forward to to getting this underway in full play in, in 2021 as much as we can with the global pandemic. And we know we're all um, chomping to, to get lacrosse on the field in, in 2020, and we're struggling to do that. But um, actually in 2021, 2020's um, gone, thankfully. Over. <laughs> Over. So as we go down to 2021 and we, we try and get lacrosse on the field to play, despite the challenges with the global pandemic, uh, we will trial this sport we will get as many high-level competitions as we can, and we'll make adjustments and continue to try and get this rule set improved and, and get the best set of possible playing rules as we can. With the goal that, that this will be participated in the 2022 World Games right. in Birmingham, Alabama, and we want to put the very best showcase for the sport. One of the things you, you mentioned is, um, will this decrease the competitive gap between number one country and number 68 now sure. in, in world across. We now have 68 member countries. I think it will. Um, I don't know how much, but some of our countries have a core group of great players, but not the depth that maybe right. the US, Canada, Iroquois Nationals, Australia, Great Britain, and some others have. So we think this will, will create some very competitive contests. It right. should be incredibly exciting to watch. So. We're really looking forward to the launch next year. And one of the parallels has been uh, Rugby Sevens, where you see countries that may not be able to, to field a team that's capable of winning a World Championship or a World Cup, a medal, in the full field version of rugby, but in the, in the smaller Sevens discipline, they're right there, battling for top spots. Yeah, we've seen a number of countries that have you know, different athlete bases than yeah. might lend itself to, to full rugby, do very, very well in Sevens. Maybe they don't have the history, maybe they don't have the tradition, Maybe they don't have the full budget or the full athlete pool, but a number of them have been able to jump up, compete now in Rugby Sevens, and I think it's been a great thing for rugby, and I think it'll be a great thing for lacrosse. You mentioned 2020, and I don't think any of us want to spend too much time on it, but there is an important point that we should discuss relative to 2020. It was, of course, a year that brought unprecedented disruption to every aspect of life, including, of course, sport. And like every other international federation, World Lacrosse was forced to make the difficult decision to postpone world level competition, in the case of World Lacrosse, the men's U20 World Championship, which was scheduled for Ireland. Um, in dealing with the pandemic, you led a major shift in the organization's resource allocation, directing record sums of funding to the national governing bodies for the purposes of COVID relief and also sport development. Talk about that process and why it was so important. Well, we had dedicated um, roughly $200,000 to development in the 2020 budget. And we thought it was very important for us not only to use that, those funds to help new national governing bodies form, but the primary purpose was to help our existing national governing bodies build and strengthen their grassroots programs, whether it was coaches development, officials development, um, clinics for athletes, um, you know, discover lacrosse programs, whatever it might be, we thought those funds were um, critically important to help build this game around the world. And, and strengthen some of our other countries uh, besides those core group that are, that are really strong now. Uh, once the global pandemic hit, all of our NGBs were in the same boat, our national governing bodies. They were struggling uh, to make ends meet, struggling to keep their programming going uh, without, without a lot of the revenue streams they normally enjoy. So we added another 200,000 to development and, and roughly uh, almost that much in uh, COVID grants. So at the, the end of the year, we'll give out well, well over four hundred dollars to $500,000, depending on 
uh, this last tranche of, of grants that are, that are came in in late December, but will go out in, in early January, what will, what will be 2020 grants. Um, so we've, we've provided an opportunity and, and we cut a lot of our expenses. We cut about a third of our expenses as an organ, organization, but at the same time, we increased our funding to our national governing bodies and hopefully that trickles down to our athletes. So we thought it was important to allow them to continue their programming, to continue to exist, and to continue, continue to function uh, during a very, very difficult year. We don't know what will happen in 2021 yet. We may have to continue some of those grant programs. Development grants will continue. We'll also add uh, grants to our Continental Federations in 2021. But we're looking forward to uh, a better year where we can all get on the field of play. We all are. And I know when you took this concept initially to the board of directors, to President Sue Redfern, to Bob DeMarco, who heads the development committee, they were immediately receptive to your recommendation that we take a fresh look at the organization's budget and resource allocation and make sure we were doing everything possible to support NGBs through this unprecedented and difficult time. Yeah, it, it was something that was very natural for our board because um, most of them come from national governing bodies. They understood the difficulties the governing bodies were having. Uh, we, we felt strongly and the board felt strongly um, and Bob DeMarco as the leader of the development committee felt strongly we had an obligation to help our member countries where we could. Yeah. And that's what we did in 2020, and I think we're incredibly proud of that. So despite the pandemic, uh, World Lacrosse did welcome five new members during a 14-month period. And I just want to recognize those groups. I know you do as well. Lithuania Lacrosse, the Barbados Lacrosse Association, Panama Lacrosse Association, the Dominican Republic Lacrosse Association, and the U.S. Virgin Islands Lacrosse Association. Those groups all came on board as new national governing bodies between December 2019 and November 2020. Importantly, World Lacrosse also recognized its first full member from the continent of Africa, that being Uganda Lacrosse. With all of that activity against the backdrop of a pandemic, to you, what does that say about the interest in lacrosse worldwide? Well, the sport has incredible interest in, and there's tremendous desire. Um, and the people who are involved in the game really want to help build it and give lacrosse to the world. So whether it's people from North America going out, uh, or people in those spots of the world um, who are using their resources to foster the game. There's an incredible desire uh, to see this, this game grow and, to, and for young people to have an opportunity to participate in it. Um, and we really want to grow, um, as we talked about before, uh, because it's part of our vision. We also want to help it to bolster our Olympic um, dream. But I, I think one of the things that's, you know, it's phenomenal that we were, we were able to grow five new countries, uh, add a full member as well, yeah. uh, during a year of a global pandemic. We have a goal, goal to get to 76 countries by the end of 2021, which I think we will achieve. We have a number of countries now that are very sure. close on the cusp of membership, and we'll be recommending uh, those to our, our other members for approval quickly. Um, but during a global pandemic, for the sport to continue to grow uh, speaks to the value of the sport speaks to the leaders in the sport and, and what they're doing. And uh, it's, it's, it's really um, something that we're very pleased with uh, and puts a lot of wind in our sails to help give those people the resources they need to help go grow, grow the game. Jim, I think we're all ready to be past 2020. Let's look ahead to 2021 and 2022. What are the major priorities for World Lacrosse and its membership this year and next? We have some very key priorities, which I would call critical path uh, objectives which will help us meet uh, our long-term vision for the game of both growth and Olympic inclusion. Uh, the first among those is to successfully launch Lacrosse Sixes. We need to launch the brand, we need to hold a number of competitions, uh, we, need to, we need to explain this to the lacrosse community and, and build broad acceptance of, of the game, uh, this new discipline and what we're trying to do. Uh, we need to build and diversify our revenue streams. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be launching a uh, annual giving program, we'll be launching a sponsorship program, and we'll be increasing our merchandise and licensing programs. Uh, we also need to continue to, as we just talked about, grow our membership, grow, grow those to uh, 76 members, as well as to help strengthen our existing members and their ability to offer programs. Uh, we need to continue to, to streamline our governance and build our leadership capabilities as an, as an organization. Um, and I think really importantly, uh, build our digital following as a sport sure. 
and continue to, to build our brand and build that digitally following. And last, uh, we need to, to get out. Um, 2020 was a hard year to get out, but in 2021, we need to get out and sell this sport uh, to the Olympic family, to the Alley 2020 at Organizing Committee and continue to, to build um, lacrosse's profile within those groups, um, build the val what lacrosse stands for with those, those groups and build some champions uh, for our game within, within the decision makers who will decide our fate in a, in a few years. So um, some really ambitious goals in 2021, but, but really key for us to continue to progress uh, on our path to, uh, to achieve our vision as a sport. No, no, no question, a critical year ahead. You're now in your fourth year as Chief Executive Officer of World Lacrosse. You're the first full-time employee of the organization. Talk for just a minute or two, if you would please, about some of the changes, the notable changes you've seen during your four-year tenure as CEO. Well, it's been an interesting uh, four years, almost four years now. Um, one, I'm very grateful to be in this position and, and to have this uh, opportunity to both lead and steward the sport as the CEO. Um, and, our, and the board has um, tremendous leadership as well at World Across. Uh, but we've been able to make some pretty significant strides in just um, a little under four years that I've been here. Uh, as you mentioned, when I started, I was the first employee. Uh, we've now gone to a, a staff of eight, soon to, soon to be 10, uh, with another three or four contractors uh, that support us on an ongoing basis. Our budget has gone from you know, roughly 100,000 100, to 150,000 a year to now over 3 million. Um, our benefits that go directly to our members have gone from uh, under 100,000, maybe more so 50,000 to, to 100,000 on a good year to now totaling uh, directly more than 600,000 and indirectly a lot more than that. Right. Um, we're adding some world events. So we've, uh, we've added a, a significant amount of, of uh, of energy into our events, and I think this next round of event bidding will see a whole new level of World Across events for our fans and uh, participants to enjoy. One of the key things we've done with, with bringing yourself on board is to try and build the brand of this game, build a social uh, media and digital following, uh, and build our broadcast properties. And we've, we've made tremendous strides uh, in just under four years in, in all of those areas. Um, we're very proud of what we've done in, in these short four years, but I think um, we're, we're at a point now where uh, I would almost say a kind of a tipping point, where in the next year and a half to two years, you're going to see a, a tremendous amount of, of new progress. So um, sit back and, and, uh, <laughs> buckle and <up>. watch, <laughs> buckle up, but it's going to be a great ride um, as we position this sport and, and hopefully uh, gain inclusion in the 2028 Olympic Games. So. Been a great ride for me. I'm very, very pleased to be here and, and part of this great sport. Jim, Jim, with your background as an Olympian and a leader in the Olympic movement and in international sport more broadly, I know you have great respect for every international federation that's out there, those that are in the Olympic Games, those that aspire to one day be there. But I'm hard pressed to find another international federation that in the last four years has experienced the kind of growth and progress you just described. I think that's true. I mean, there are a number, and there are a number of, of sports that, you know, have great leadership, Fantastic and, and leadership. great support, yep. and, and uh, all due respect to those sports. I think lacrosse um, has a great set of ingredients, as I, as I described earlier, uh, the values of this sport, the attractiveness of the sport, the heritage and tradition of the sport, the people who play it, the people who coach it, and the people who lead it, all have a great mix that will allow us uh, to continue to to achieve our vision of growth and, and one day hopefully Olympic inclusion. Um, I'm just really pleased to be part of it. Um, and you know, the Olympic family is, it's a, a big grouping of sports and, and, but I think there's a place for lacrosse uh, and I think we bring a lot to, to the Olympic family and uh, I'm looking forward to, to this next chapter. One last question for you. U.S. lacrosse is the largest of the 68 national governing bodies that are members of World Lacrosse. Very successful, very strong national governing body, uh, tremendous membership. As we close here today, what would your message be to people watching this presentation, the members of U.S. Lacrosse? What would your encouragement or message be to them to, to help continue the uh, growth of the game, but also to support the Olympic ambition that World Lacrosse has? Well, I think everybody involved with U.S. Lacrosse can can feel rightfully proud of 
the progress they've made in the last 25 years. Remarkable. Um, they've gone from a very small organization with a non-existent membership to now over 400,000 members, an incredible uh, model national governing body for all the governing bodies in any sport in the United States. And they can and should be incredibly proud of that. And the growth of the game at the high school level, the growth of the game at the college level, now the continued growth of the game at the professional level. I think all of that bodes well, but I think as we've seen, all traditional sports are challenged now. Um, growth has stagnated. Um, kids are finding other avenues to, to stay active and, and get involved in uh, non-sport activities or activities that they do on their or, uh, devices other than going outside and, and uh, um, throwing a, a ball around with a stick. So uh, we all in sport, and, and those of us, uh, particularly in, in North America and the United States, and those of you at World Across, um, now is the time we can really redouble our efforts and um, make progress that will allow this sport to grow for the next generation in the next 25 years. Should lacrosse be on the Olympic stage, I think the growth that you've seen in the last 25 years will pale in comparison to the growth we can achieve in the next 25 years. So join with us. We need you. You're our primary governing body. You are the governing body of lacrosse in the United States where we hope to be in in the 2028 games. So we need U.S. lacrosse. We need the U.S. lacrosse members with us. We need the United States lacrosse committee, community with us. And we're there with you. We're, we're world lacrosse. We want to grow the game around the world. But this market is incredibly important and one that we're incredibly proud of and pleased with the work you've done. Um, and let's, let's get the next chapter. Let's, let's continue to make our mark and, and build this great game. Jim, thank you very much for your time today and your leadership. We greatly appreciate it. You're welcome, Daryl. Thank you.